Hey, well, welcome to Branch Life. My name is Pastor Josh, and we are in week three of Rest for the Stressed. Last week, we talked about rest for the tech stressed because, man, we are dealing with a brand new problem for a brand new generation. And I don't know if you were able to catch our talk last week, and I don't know if it changed anything about your tech use this week, but hopefully it's helped us to think and engage in a conversation. Uh, we, ha- we are in our semi-finale tonight. We have one more week after tonight in our Rest for the Stress series, and I want to just start off right from the bat and say you need to be here next week. For our finale. You need to be a part of the closing of this discussion. We're calling it Real Rest for the Stressed. And it may be unlike any church service you've been to before, but we're going to interact together. We're going to experience uh, putting ourselves and giving our burdens over to God next Sunday night. We're going to wrap this entire series up. You don't want to miss it. I invite you to come and I invite you to bring others that may be encouraged by it. But tonight we want to ask you simply this question. Have you ever been sick and tired of being sick and tired? How many have been there in this space at one time or another? Say amen. Oh, amen. Being sick and tired of being sick and tired is kind of like our default for Americans. It's kind of like where we kind of end up at the end of every day. And we say, you know what, tomorrow will be another day. I'm not going to feel this sick and tired, but man, we're sick and tired. It's kind of like we've become our iPhones. And our batteries become drained, and we need to get plugged in, and we need to wind ourselves back up. Have you ever stopped to ask yourself, what is draining your battery so fast? What are some of the reasons that you may be literally sick and tired? Let me give you a couple of ideas today. Maybe you're like this person. Half of all pet owners allow their animals to sleep in bed with them. Half. Now, we have a golden retriever. And one of us in our marriage relationship, my wife and I, would allow the dog to sleep in the bed, and the other would not. I won't say who that is. I will just say the dog does not sleep in our bed. It doesn't happen. Now, there was a study, a scientific study that was published in a scientific journal. Listen, this is, I don't know how people spent money on this, but here here was the founding of this study. Pet owners who allow their animals to sleep in bed with them report that they are more tired than non-pet owners who allow their bed, who don't allow them in their beds with them. That was the conclusion. If you let your bet in the bed, you will be more tired. Because the average dog is up 20 times a night. So, so maybe you're one of these half of all pet owners who lets the animal sleep in bed and you find yourself a little bit more drained. But maybe it's this. Half of all children sleep in the same... No, it's not the same stats. It's not the same stats. But I do want to give you uh, another scientific study that was proven and and published and put out there. And again, these conclusions are, I think they are run by rocket scientists. Parents who have uh, children who wake them up frequently at night, three to ten times a night, this was the scientific conclusion, the next day report being less able to focus and to have a more negative mood. So the scientific conclusion of allowing kids to interrupt your sleep over and over again is the next day you won't be able to focus, you will find yourself in a daze, and you will be grumpy, dazed and grumpy. Parents, dazed and grumpy. The conclusion went on to say this. These results will accumulate over time if the interruption to sleep continues for weeks or months on end. The more your children wake you up at night, the more dazed and grumpy you will be. There's scientific proof to not allow your kids to wake you up at night. But every parent knows there's almost no way to avoid it because this is parenting. 
dazed and confused, not able to focus. No wonder you're sick and tired. Now listen, parenting is not the only thing that drains our batteries. There are other reasons that we get tired and exhausted out there. There's other reasons that as Americans we tend to find ourselves needing to recharge and, and being sick and tired of being sick and tired. You may just be fighting some sort of illness uh, somewhere along the way. A few weeks ago, we had a talk called Rest Yourself Before You Wreck Yourself. And for whatever reason, that week, I had a horrible time getting sleep. I was going on three, four, five hours of sleep instead of my usual 12 hours of sleep. So I came to that talk exhausted. And now this week, I'm sp speaking on being sick and tired. And I have spent the majority of this week being sick. I'm about 70% tonight as I stand here today. And my doctors say there's some sort of lung infection going on. It's super exciting. I'm not coughing up a storm because there's miracle medicine inside of me right now. It's just fantastic stuff that's allowing me to breathe in and out while I'm up here. So I thought if I slept, if I, if I talked on needing rest and then I wouldn't get rest, if I talked about being sick, I'd be sick. sick. Next week we're going to talk about how to be rich. And we'll see what this next week <laughs> holds for us. But you may be fighting a common cold or a lung infection, and you may find, like me, that it drains yourself, and all you get accomplished in a week is catching the Downton Abbey Marathon. But you may be dealing with something a little bit more serious than that. You know, there are different diagnoses that come into our lives that, that can overtake us. And whether it's something serious like cancer, or dealing with dementia in yourself, or a loved one battling something like Alzheimer's, could be a chronic condition or a chronic pain of some kind that you're dealing with. For about the last 10 years, I've been battling Lyme's disease. And it's something that for me, if I overdo it, my gas tank tends to empty a little bit sooner than it would if I didn't have this chronic diagnosis going on. But even longer than that, even longer than 10 years, I've been dealing with uh, a learning disability. And ever since they tried to teach me how to read, it's caused me extra angst and extra work. And of course, God knew he was going to call me into a profession where I was supposed to read and write for a living. But it's nothing compared to what some of you are dealing with and facing. Life-threatening illness. Uncontrollable, uh, uncurable pain. Chronically discouraging you day after day, being a caretaker for someone who is in a downward spiral, having to be a parent or a loved one with someone with disability. All of these things can come into our lives and cause us to be drained, to be sick, to be tired. And then, of course, there's all the emotional turmoil that we can deal with day in and day out. Very real conditions connected to depression and discouragement, anorexia, OCD, and all kinds of things that can come in and dominate our lives. And just trying to get through the day actually takes everything that you've got. And if you've ever been in a season where you've dealt with any of these or others like it, if you've battled illness or if you've been trying to raise kids, you will realize that this next statement is full of truth. Sometimes sleep doesn't help if it's your soul that is tired. Sometimes sleep doesn't help if your soul is tired. And tonight, what we want to talk about is more than being able to rest as a parent, although we're going to give you some of that advice. It's more than being able to deal, deal with whatever illness or diagnosis or syndrome that you're involved in. It's about addressing the needs of your soul. Because if your soul is tired, there is no amount of sleep or medicine in the world that will help you rest, truly rest. And so what I believe God has for you tonight is soul peace and soul rest. We want to look at a passage in the Bible that is all directly out of the mouths of Jesus. And Jesus is saying the things that we're going to look at tonight, and he's the one that's teaching on it. No matter what your view of Jesus is, if you think he was a good teacher or if you think he was the son of God, these words carry weight. And tonight we want to actually look at what Jesus has to say 
about resting when we are sick and tired. So if you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to go with me to John chapter 15 and John chapter 16. We're going to end up specifically in John chapter 16. We're going to see what Jesus' answers are for being sick and tired and where we can really truly find soul peace. Let's pray together. God, as we open your word and as we read it, We pray that you would help to encourage all of us, no matter uh, what energy level we come in at today. God, we pray that in this time and in this space that we would truly be able to rest in you. And Lord, that the words of Jesus would impact our lives and our hearts. And God, that we could learn from them and that we could grow in them. And that tonight you would strengthen our connection to Christ so that we can be a blessing to others. Please bless the reading of your word in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. I want to tell you a little bit about the section of, of scripture that we're in tonight, and just, just lay a background on you because I believe it's going to help you with the significance of these words. Imagine if you knew that you were having a meal tonight with precious friends and with precious family, and it was going to be the last chance that you had to talk with them. It was going to be your last meal together because you knew that tomorrow was coming some significant life changes. That would alter everything. That is exactly the situation we find ourselves here with Jesus. He has gathered his closest friends, his disciples. He has gathered people that he loves dearly and who love him dearly. And Jesus knows in this moment that the meal that they're having together is going to be their last meal together before he dies. In just a few short days from this time, in a few short hours, Jesus would be hanging on a cross. And the process of going from this meal to that cross was going to be a a torturous one, not only for him, but for all of his followers. And so he was going to have a conversation and choose his words to his dear, dear friends very, very carefully in these chapters. You know, this week, if you have time, I want to encourage you, spend time in John chapter 13, 14, 15, and 16. Some really incredible teaching takes place in this moment. And remember to yourself, this is the last advice. This is the last counsel. This is the last things that Jesus wanted to say to his dear friends before he died. It's in these verses that we hear some very famous famous, uh, quotes from Jesus. Like, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God and believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself that where I am, there you may also be. Imagine sitting at a table with Jesus and him start talking like that. He he said something about going and rooms in his Father's house and he's going to come back and they didn't fully grasp what was being said, but man, Knowing what Jesus is talking about brings richness to this, not only for his disciples, but for you and me. Do you believe in God? Do you believe in Jesus? Have you started a personal relationship with him? He's going to bring this topic up over and over during this meal. He's going to go on and he's going to say this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. If you're sitting at that dinner table and you're wondering, how do I get to heaven? How do I know God? How do I have a relationship with him? Do I be good enough? Do I attend a church? Do I follow a religion? Jesus says, no, it's none of those things. It's through me. It's through a personal relationship with me, Jesus Christ, that you can come to the Father. I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way. Have you chosen to believe in Jesus? Have you chosen to believe that he is who he says he was and that he is the son of God? He goes on and and has some more incredible teaching. Later on in chapter 14 and verse 27, he says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. This is not the first or last time Jesus is going to bring up the topic of peace during this meal. One of our favorite verses as a church, it's what our name is based off of, Branch Life Church, is given during this discussion. In chapter 15 and verse 5, he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. 
Whoever abides in me and I in him, it is he that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. We are a church that believes the stronger our connection to Christ, the greater our reach in the world. And it's with and because of our connection to Jesus that we are anything. If you're here tonight and you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, the solution is wrapped up in your connection to Christ. It's vital because apart from Christ, you can do nothing. He goes on with some incredible advice. In chapter 15 and verse 11, he says, These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Jesus wants to give you life and life more abundantly. He wants you to have joy in this life. He doesn't want you to go around being sick and tired of being sick and tired. Verse 12, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, than someone lay down his life for his friends. In just a few short hours, Jesus was going to do that very thing. He was going to lay down his life for us. Greater love has no man than this. And then we jump down to verse 16. As the supper goes on, he says in 16 verse 1, I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. Don't let anything in this life distract you. There are things that are going to bombard you and try to pull you away from a relationship with Jesus. But I'm telling you what I'm telling you so that you stay connected with me, so that you do not fall away. In 16 verse 12, I still have many things to say to you, but I can, you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. And Jesus is beginning to hint at one of the greatest, most powerful instruments in a Christian's life. And that's a relationship with the Holy Spirit. And everything that Jesus is saying to them now, the Holy Spirit is going to say and take further in everyone's life who is connected to Christ. We don't have time to go into the significance of the Holy Spirit, but it's not a coincidence that Jesus mentions it at the end of his talk. And he mentions him over and over and over again, along with the word peace. He says this in verse 28 in chapter 16, I came from the Father, and I have come into the world. I am now leaving the world, and I am going to the Father. In verse 32, behold, the hour is coming indeed, and it has come, when you, my friends, will be scattered, each into his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. And then tonight, as we dive into some Bible sense, we want to look at this closing statement that Jesus gives his dear, dear friends. In chapter 16, in verse 33, Jesus says this, I have said these things to you, everything that I've quoted and more, that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble or tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. There's three incredible soul-filling truths just in this verse alone. And tonight we want to just take a few moments and see what these three soul-filling truths are. These will help your soul rest so that your body can rest, so that your emotions can rest, so that your spirit can rest. This is soul transform transformational truths that we want to give to you tonight. And the first one is found in this phrase, that in me you may have peace. I want to just kind of give you the statement in a, in a modern form. It's simply this. Rest is not possible without peace. Rest is not possible without peace. And who understands this more than every parent ever? We can't rest without peace. Have you tried? Have you tried to rest while people were running through your house and making messes and dishes were breaking and dogs were barking and children were screaming and crying? And as parents, you're like, oh, I, don't know if I, can, I don't know if I can deal with this. It starts when you're pregnant, right? It starts with this kind of like, I know this is coming. I don't feel good. My whole body hurts. And there's this thing inside of me that's growing that's someday going to come out and it's going to need me. And then it comes out and then it needs you, right? And you're like, how do I deal with this? I remember being in the hospital, and I've mentioned this before. 
with our first child, Delaney, and she was born, and she was under five pounds when she came out of the hospital. She was teeny, teeny, tiny. And I remember holding her and thinking, I'm going to break her. I'm going to break this baby. I don't know what to do. You know, it's kind of that classic, like, first-time dad thing where, like, I don't know. Is it, like, the football hold, or is it the, what do I do? And so I'm in this midst of a panic moment, and the nurse comes in and wants to re-swaddle her. If you don't know what swaddling is, figure it out on the internet. <laughs> and she, she grabs Delaney, who's this little thing, and I'm like, careful, that's a baby. And she kind of tends to flip her around and moves her, and all of a sudden she's tucked in and neat, and she's kind of holding her with one arm and talking and drinking and feeding herself and driving all at the same time. And I'm like, this is pretty incredible. Like, that nurse is pretty awesome. Maybe the baby won't break every time I touch her. And I remember thinking, you know what? I could do this. Then we got the baby home. And my wife called in all the reinforcements, like family and friends and everybody we could possibly get over to help us deal with this baby. Now, here's the problem with babies. They turn into toddlers. And toddlers can move. I mean, man, they can move. And, and you're not only keeping them fed and clean and alive, you're now keeping them in one confined space, right? And then the problem with toddlers is they turn into elementary kids. And then elementary kids turn into, you ready for this? Preteens. And preteens, you got hormones and, and pimples and tests at school and arguments and and cell phones, and now preteens turn into teenagers who think they know everything, and they don't need anybody except your wallet, of course. And they're always right, and they're always pushing for more, and they're always stretching you as thin as you can possibly get, and, and just when you think it couldn't get any worse, then comes college. And yeah, I may have shipped them off somewhere, but boy, I've got to pay for it. And I've got to sign what, for how long, and where, and when? And I still have a mortgage on my house because I've got eight kids. There's just no rest without peace. There's just no rest without peace. Now, I want to give you a little advice for parents tonight. This is kind of bonus advice, and it's, it's connected this idea of being sick and tired. But if, if parenting is the thing that has you drained, here's some helpful common sense but I believe it's also scriptural that will be an encouragement to you tonight. We need to stop freaking out about our kids. Now, don't get mad at me because I'm not the one that said this. I made sure you understood this came from someone else. Kevin DeYoung says we need to stop freaking out about our kids. If you've ever seen a news report, if you've ever been to a sporting event where parents have freaked out, you know this is true. It's a ridiculous fact of life that we have parents getting into brawls at little girls' soccer games. It's a ridiculous thought to think that parents are going to be so passionate about what call the ref made or what some other parent said or what the coach did because your little kid's out there trying to get a black and white ball into a net. But we as parents tend to to freak out about our kids. Here's some common sense advice. Stop it. Stop freaking out about your kids. Your kids are not as fragile as you think you, they are. Your kids do not need you to fight every battle for them. As a matter of fact, that is unhealthy. Your kids just need your love and support. Well, I was just being a mama bear. Don't. If you find yourself saying, that's the mama bear coming out of me, you've crossed a line. You're freaking out about your kids. And maybe you're a papa bear, and you do the same thing. Knock it off. We need to stop freaking out about our kids. Now, here's some advice that I want to give you about how to stop freaking out. There's three things to watch out for. Number one, beware of kindergarten. Kindergarten is the danger or the reality of being ruled by your children. Do not be ruled by your children. Don't let your children rule your life, your schedule, or your household. We in America have become child-centric in our households. What our kids want, where they want to go, what they participate, their schedules, their desires, their needs dictate 
to the rest of the household what the plan is. This is not a healthy way to live. I've seen it best expressed if I compare two types of families. Family A has an, is, a, is a mom and dad and an only child. Yet that family is extremely busy and stressed, running from appointments and practices and recitals and games. They are rarely at church because there is often conflicts with their child's schedule. If they are there, they are coming in late and they are leaving early because there's some place to be and a place they've got to go. They're not able to be a part of a small group because of what their kids' schedules are like. Yet, if I compare them to family B, they have five kids. And they are not less busy, but they are much less frantic. And they are able to be hospitable and opening their, their home. They almost never miss church. And as a matter of fact, when they're there, they tend to be there early. They are involved in serving and hosting and being a part of the community. Why can one family deal with the pressures in life, and why can the other not? It's kindergarten. You just can't simply say yes to everything. Let your home be ruled by the guidelines of Christ and by the decisions of the parent, not the kids. Number two, find ways to be less frantic. In the book, Crazy Busy, there was some research pointed out that talked about what kids want most. And there was a little bit of surprise. Most people think that if you ask your kids what do they want most out of their parents, they would say something like more time with mom and dad. But that was not the answer. The answer, the thing that kids want most, is not more time with their parents. They want their parents to be less tired and stressed. And if you know that you're dealing with raising a family, this can be absolutely true. It's horrible when dad comes home and he's just at the end of himself. Or mom's so flustered and frustrated that they're not able to enjoy their evening together or their weekend because there's something that's always stressing them out. There's something that's always exhausting them. And so parents, we need to find a way to be less frantic. We need to find a way to allow ourselves to rest and to schedule our lives and deal with the different things that come through. And, and what are those ways? Stay tuned as we have the rest of the conversation tonight. And lastly, focus on getting a few things right, not everything right. Focus on getting a few things right. And the Bible gives us some advice about parenting, but it's actually not in there a whole lot. There's not tons and tons of verses on parenting. But when parenting comes up, it's, it's summed up in these few things. Number one, it's your responsibility, parents, to teach your kids about God. That's so important. And in, in the plan of the church was families being involved and, and people coming together to help raise our kids in, this, in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's part of the significant purposes of the church. Yet so many times our kids cause us to miss active participation in the very thing that's going to help them the most. So we, we strive to teach them about God. We need to discipline and correct their behavior. We need to show them what is right and wrong. We need to be thankful for them. Most of you know that our story, uh, Jenny and I's story, it was a battle of infertility for seven years before we were able to have Delaney. And there is almost nothing that Delaney and Will could do that I would look at them and say, I just love you so much. Do you know how hard it was for us to get you? Do you know what we went through and how we prayed and how many tears we cried just to be able to have kids? And I, if you want to wake me up 30 times a night, fine. I'm just thankful you're in my life. But sometimes we lose that spirit of thankfulness for the gifts that children are. And the Bible tells us to not exasperate them. To not exasperate them. So parents, if you need help in any of these, write down these references and jump in. There's a lot more that we could say about parenting, but for sake of time, we can't do it tonight. So tomorrow night at 9 p.m., we're going to do another talk back with PJ. That's me, Pastor Josh, and it's going to be on Facebook Live, and uh, we're going to give you more, uh, more hints, more advice for resting as a parent. The second soul resting piece of advice that we find in John chapter 16, verse 33, comes from the next phrase, I have said these things to you that in me you ha may have peace. In this world, you will have tribulation. Now, 
There's a 100% guarantee in this verse. Yet it's something we often forget. And the guarantee is you will have trouble. There's no getting away from it. There's, there's no avoiding it. But somehow we've got it into our American brains that we will eventually get to the place that we're very safe, we're very secure, we're very comfortable, and we're going to be able to stay in our PJs all day. But that's just not the guarantee that the Bible says. The Bible says that we will have trouble. Listen, we live in a broken world. We use broken bodies. We are surrounded by other broken people. Trouble is a guarantee. Yet when trouble comes, we often act surprised. I remember a horrible surprise. Uh, I was driving down from our old church in Downingtown, uh, down 322, and I went past a friend's house, and I looked at the friend's house, and the entire roof was just billowing black smoke. I immediately pulled my car over, and I had gotten to the house that was totally on fire before the family that lived there. A fireman had started to gather, police had started to come, and I was standing across the street. And so I was there when my good friend came back to their house to realize that everything they owned was on fire. And I remember holding my friend in, in my arms as she literally collapsed and sobbed in tears overwhelmed with the sudden loss of everything that they had worked so hard for. You see, they never thought in a million years that it would happen to them. They never thought it was their house that would catch on fire, but it did, and it does. And one of the hardest things about trouble is it often takes us by surprise. But here's the principle. The less we expect to suffer, the more devastating suffering becomes. The less we expect to suffer, the more devastating suffering becomes. Listen, if you know now, if you start talking to God now about the trouble that's going to come, you will be more prepared to face it. If you start planning now that there will be some day that death will enter into your life, you will be more equipped for it. God is warning us. God is preempting us. God is saying to us, in this world, you will have this thing called trouble. So let's not be surprised by pain. Let's not be overwhelmed when it comes into our lives. But let's be prepared. Prepared by strengthening our connection to Christ to deal with it. And so just like we gave some advice to parents, I want to give some advice for those of us that are here tonight and in, are in pain. Realizing that most pain that we face is of no fault of our own but a fault of this broken world. So what do we do when we find ourselves in an overwhelming situation, when an accident has come in and changed our plans, when we've got a diagnosis that we don't know what to do with it, or something equally difficult is happening to someone that we love? Number one, beware of pain archy. Beware of pain archy. And this is the temptation to allow troubling circumstances to rule your life. Don't let the pain be the thing that is in charge because it is not. My friends, I'm here to tell you that God is in control, that he is sovereign, and that he is more powerful than any pain that you are facing. And he's asked you to cast all your cares on him. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that next week. The pain, the condition, the illness, the accident does not define you. It is not who you are and it is, does not separate you from the love of God. Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39 simply say that there is nothing. There is no height, no depth. There is no power in this world or in this universe that can separate you from the love of God. So don't let pain rule your life. Number two, find ways to be less frantic. You do not have to be this tired and stressed. You do not have to be this tired and stressed. You are in control of your stress level. And I know you might, you might want to argue with me on that. I can't do this about my schedule and they didn't say and I, That's just surprise. But remember, through a relationship with God, you can allow your soul to be at peace 
and you will be able to find ways to be less stressed and less tired. Philippians chapter 2 says simply this, rejoice always. And again, I say rejoice. Not rejoice some days, but rejoice always. There is a way to handle anything that comes your way with joy and with peace. And the Bible says that no matter what it is you're facing, if you take it to the Lord in prayer, he promises to you a peace that passes all understanding. And when there is peace, you can rest. No matter what you're going through. And then, focus on getting just a few things right. Trust God with all those things that are coming into your life. Take it one step at a time. Sometimes one minute at a time. But these are the things that we focus on and should matter more to us than the the troubles and tribulation that's in our lives. Number one, love God with all your heart. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Don't let pain separate you from the love of God. Love your neighbor as yourself. Focus on someone else when it feels like your world is falling in on you. Go and make disciples, telling other people about the good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And whatever you do, whether there for you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. If we can just focus on these things, if these become the things that matter to us, no matter what else comes, we can handle it. Because you can do all things through Christ that gives you strength. The last soul encouraging piece of advice that we get from John chapter 16 verse 33 comes from the next phrase. In this world you will have tribulation, but... Take heart, I have overcome the world. You know, I think the most important two words in these verses are found in the second line and in the last line. Me and I. Remember, Jesus is talking. It's the last thing that he's saying to the people that he loves dearly. And he is reminding them that their relationship with Jesus, the power And the ability to rest, not just physically, but spiritually, to allow your soul to rest, is found in a relationship with Jesus. So we take our statement one step further. Rest is not possible without peace. Peace is not possible without Christ. Peace is not possible without Christ. What happens when we're overwhelmed with parenting? What happens when we're surrounded and dealing with pain? We often push Christ and the things of Christ away so that we can care for ourselves. And we should do the exact opposite, and we should run to Christ, and we should run to the things of Christ. The way that you take heart, the way that you encourage your soul is with Jesus. He is the answer. He is the way that you are less frantic. He is the way that you are less tired and stressed. We've been talking about a relationship with Jesus, but let me remind you about something significant that happens when you accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I, Jesus, go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. The moment that you accept the Lord Jesus Christ into your life, he sends you a Helper. And that helper is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit takes residence inside of you. He guides you. He leads you. He comforts you. And he encourages you. He prays for you. He seals you before God. And he baptizes you in himself. That Holy Spirit is the source of power and energy that you have on a spiritual and physical realm. Now we can choose to focus on fleshly things or we can choose to focus on spiritual things. And the more that you feed your relationship with the Spirit, the more that you strengthen your connection to Christ, the more power you unleash in your life. And you can walk in the power of the Spirit. And you are then able to bear fruit, no matter what comes. So tonight I want to encourage you, Christian, to strengthen your walk with the Spirit. Dedicate yourself to personal and corporate worship to a prayer life that gives everything over to God, to a, to a conversation with Jesus that takes place in reading his word, to fellowship with the body of believers in this place called the church, which is God's plan A for our time today. And to dedicate yourself 
to running after Christ. No single practice brings more rest than listening at the feet of Jesus. No single practice brings more rest than listening at the feet of Jesus. Kevin says this, there's the best advice I know. Devote yourself to the word of God and to prayer. And this means private worship and public worship. If you're here tonight and you don't know if you have a personal relationship with Jesus, I want to tell you that it's as simple as making a decision to become a follower of God. I did it when I was a young man, and you can do it today. You simply need to have a conversation with God. Acknowledge that you're a sinner. Let him know that you believe he died on the cross and he rose again from the dead, and that you are trusting in him for your own personal salvation. Tonight, you can have that conversation with God. After the service is over, we're going to have some prayer team members available here in the front. And if you want to come forward and talk with them, they would love to answer any questions you have about what it means to have a personal relationship with Jesus. If you're here today and you're dealing with some pain and some hurt, if you're just a parent that wants to pray over your kids, you too can come forward and just have some time to pray together. There's nothing more powerful that we can do for rest than pray. And strengthen your own personal worship your own personal time with God, and allow that to happen every day this week. But I also want to encourage you to be faithful in your public worship, to be a dedicated part of the church of God. So many people are starting to believe a lie that they don't need the church, that they don't need to be a part of the church. And if, if church for you is just coming to a service, then you're right. You don't need that. But church is so much more than a couple of songs and a preacher. Church is gathering together to follow Jesus. It's like-minded people who have a like-minded mission to reach and proclaim the name of Jesus in their town and in their community. To love one another as Christ has loved us. So at Branch Life, we don't just get together on Sundays, although that's extremely important and we value it. We also gather together in groups because groups is where we can live on mission. Groups is where we can make strong connections. Group is where we can have concentrated times in prayer. Groups is where we can literally serve our neighbors. Groups is where we can party and have a great time together. Groups can do incredible things. We have all kinds of groups here at Branch Life and we're open to all kinds of new groups. And we hope that by God's grace, as we grow, we will constantly be launching more and different varieties of groups. And we see in other churches some amazing things that God's are doing through groups. And I recently learned of a church that has a group just for people that are dealing with chronic pain and chronic illness. And this small group exists in this church to allow uh, this community of people dealing with similar trials to come together, to support one another, and to pray for each other. And I just want you to see a little bit about what groups can do when the church of God comes together in these smaller settings. An irresistible church, to me, is one that anyone could come to, no matter what they're bringing to the table. Ministry is messy, and it's a church that embraces that mess. Overcomers is a group for life-defining diseases such as cancer, MS, Lyme's disease, Alzheimer's. It includes both the patient and the caregiver. Overcomers was derived from the verse from John 16, verse 33. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. By the application of God's word, prayer, and community, we teach our overcomers that they have a plan and they have a purpose in Christ's kingdom. My favorite quote to the group is, as long as your toes wiggle, God's got a purpose and a plan for your life. You are not done until you see him face to face. First night of overcomers, I had the privilege of meeting a young gal, Spitfire, about five feet tall, her name is Debbie, and Debbie had pancreatic cancer. 
the end of the night, I noticed that she was kind of waiting by the doorway, wanted to have a conversation with me. Told me that she was getting her life in order and that she was making amends and rebuilding bridges that she had burnt. And I had asked her about if she was ready for a Christ-filled or a Christless eternity, and she wanted to know what that meant. Um, through the conversation, we were able to give her the plan of salvation, and that night Debbie said, I want Jesus as Lord. Eight months later, I had the privilege of speaking at Debbie's funeral, and at her funeral, she, per her request, she wanted to have the plan of salvation given to 250 of her best friends and family members who had attended her funeral. Is being an overcomer easy? No, it's not. Many times you come to the meeting, you're not feeling well. A lot of our people come right after having a day of chemo. They wouldn't miss it. Overcomers is part of an irresistible church. I hope that gives you just a little taste of the potential of the power that can be found in small groups. Think about the opportunity that this group has, not only to care for one another, but to reach others with the good news, other patients, other hospital workers, other family members. And instead of withdrawing when life gets hard, they pursue community. They pursue faith and they stay on mission. You know, the answer to getting away from being sick and tired is not being in bed more or being less busy. It's being more connected to Christ because he's still got something for you to do. And at Branch Life, as we look to build our small groups, we are looking for like-minded people who will gather together to care for one another and to be on mission. So as Pastor Scott said, I want to encourage you to be a part of Branch Life Church. If you're a part of the church, or if you're interested, I want to encourage you to take that step into groups. As a part of our group launch next week, uh, we're launching a group in our neighborhood. And our neighborhood group is simply going to exist to reach other people in our neighborhood with the good news of the gospel of Lord Jesus Christ. And through personal relationships and through acts of kindness, we want to open our home and we want to be there to love on the neighbors God has given us here in the North Coventry area. If you're interested in being a part of that, we'd love to have you be a part of that group. We've got all kinds of groups that are building and forming and growing. So will you be a part of it? With this idea of strengthening your connection to Christ, Jesus says, come all Come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Be still and know I am God. If you're here tonight and your soul is tired, your spiritual soul is empty, I want to give you some opportunities to fill it up this evening. So Brooke and Rob are going to come out and they're going to sing a song for us, and you can focus on that song. All of you have that next step card, and while they're while they're singing, if you want to let us know how we can pray for you, if you want to respond, if you have any questions for the Facebook Live event, if you want to ask us about salvation or let us know that you're making a decision or you're going through a hard time, go ahead and, and give us some feedback on those cards, and we'll collect those in just a moment. Or just allow yourself to be refilled in your soul as you listen to this reminder to be still and know He is God.